Hi, this is Mike Reagan. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Logrhythm, the security intelligence company. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's uh, webcast titled, Defending Against Cyber Threats, Are You Keeping Up? An analysis of CyberEdge's 2016 Cyber Threat Defense Report. Despite record security spending, successful cyber attacks are on the rise. 76% of organizations responding to this year's survey indicated they were compromised by a successful cyber attack last year, and that's up from 62% in 2014. Most organiza organizations have come to accept that their networks will be compromised if they're not already. I am pleased to be joined today by Steve Piper. Uh, Steve is an information security researcher, author, marketer, and analyst with over 20 years of experience in the field. Steve is the CEO and co-founder of the information security research firm, CyberEdge Group. Today, we're here to share the findings of the 2016 Cyber Threat Defense Report. You'll learn about the threats, response plans, processes, and investments that organizations surveyed are making in 2016, information you can use to assess your own organization's plans to survive and thrive amidst the ever-shifting cyber threat landscape. A quick note. We'll have a, a brief uh, Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question at any time during the webinar, please submit it using the Ask a Question button located on the top left side uh, of the player. Finally, the recorded version of this presentation will be available using the same URL shortly following uh, today's presentation. So if, you, uh, if, if you'd like, please feel free to share this with your friends and colleagues using the social bookmarks button above your console. So welcome, Steve. I'm pleased to have you with me today. Hey, thanks so much, Mike. I'm very excited to be here and to tell uh, uh, the audience about our third annual Cyber Threat Defense Report. So uh, just to level set everyone, uh, not everyone is familiar with this report, uh, uh, but most of us as cybersecurity professionals are, are familiar with the Verizon report. You know, Verizon for 10 years in a row uh, has issued the uh, DBIR, the Data Breach Investigations Report. And so Verizon does a fantastic job, in my opinion. I think Verizon's report is a must-read report. Verizon does a great job telling you what sorts of threats are facing enterprises, all sorts of different categories of threats, okay, and, and how the bad guys and gals are are you know penetrating um, uh, you know these enterprise networks? Well, up until we came along, no one really had a comprehensive report to tell you what enterprises are doing about these threats, and that's where CyberEdge came in. Uh, this is a vendor agnostic report that is sponsored by 14 uh, different uh, uh, companies, and we're so proud to have Logarithm as a gold sponsor of our 2016 Cyber Threat Defense Report. But the reason I say this, this is a vendor agnostic study, because no vendor names are referenced anywhere in the, uh, in, in the study uh, and in the online survey. Okay. So this is based on a 26-question online survey, and this particular survey was conducted towards the end of 2015, uh, and there were two criteria for the respondents, and there were 1,000 respondents in total. Uh, they had to be an IT security decision maker or practitioner. So in other words, these are not IT generalists. These are IT security professionals. And they have to be employed by an organization with at least 500 employees. And, and you'll see that we have a nice uh, breakdown uh, when we get to the, uh, the next slide here. But this survey is designed to assess uh, things in four different areas. And this presentation is sectioned off in, into these four different groupings. Uh, you know, uh, questions to assess an organization's security posture. In other words, uh, you know, their ability to mitigate the risks of cyber threats. The second area is perceptions of cyber threats and cyber threat defenses. Third is attack surface reduction strategies. So, uh, you know, the use of technologies that can help reduce your attack surface by minimizing uh, uh, vulnerabilities and security misconfigurations. And the fourth area is future security plans. So those are going to be the, uh, uh, the four sections of this presentation. A okay. uh, few more words about the, uh, the, the report itself. Uh, in the way of demographics, 
Uh, this is a global survey, so we, we had participation from 10 different countries in four different regions of the world. Uh, so in North America, we had U.S. and Canada. Uh, for Europe, uh, it was U.K., Germany, and France. For Asia Pacific, it was Australia, uh, Singapore, and Japan. And in Latin America, Mexico, and Brazil. Uh, and then as, uh, in the years ahead, we're going to be expanding this into other areas. But this is very much a global survey, uh, nice uh, you know, population size of 1,000 qualified survey respondents, uh, and we're very pleased with the results. 19 different industries were represented. Uh, we're going to talk about the seven uh, most uh, popular industries in some of our slides. Uh, that were statistically significant, where we had a minimum of 50 uh, respondents from each of these uh, industries. But 19 different industries represented a nice mix of role, uh, you know, from, from uh, CISOs and VP level personnel, directors, managers, and then also your security analysts, your security administrators, your frontline security people. So a really nice mix. Also, as this the graphic uh, on the right uh, suggests, uh, nice variance of organization size. The biggest group, 37.5%, a little more than a third of the respondents, were from organizations with 1,000 to 4,999 employees. Uh, but a really nice mix on the low end, 500 to 999, that's 14%. But then we had uh, several organizations that had more than 25,000 uh, employees. Okay? And of course, when we uh, uh, get to the end of the presentation. If you haven't read the report or you would like to, uh, we'll, uh, Mike will tell you how you can uh, uh, you know, get a copy of the report and also the uh, uh, infographic. Okay? So let's dive into the report. I mentioned there's four areas of this report. Uh, the first one is uh, around uh, security posture. Okay. Now, I do recognize that some of these slides may be a little bit difficult to see. Uh, there is a mechanism uh, within BrightTalk uh, where you can enlarge the slides. If my memory is correct, I think it's in the lower part of the screen. Not sure if there's a button or if you right click, but there is a mechanism uh, to enlarge the screens to make them uh, easier to see. Um, so uh, the question that we asked for, for this topic was, what percentage of your employer's IT budget is allocated to information security, meaning products, services, and personnel? And by the way, you're going to see the sample size vary a little bit. Even though our overall sample size was 1,000, uh, in each uh, of our questions, we had a don't know response. So if, if the respondent just genuinely didn't know, uh, we don't want to capture their data. Uh, so we want to give them a way to say, I don't know. So uh, 977 people responded. Uh, in this instance, uh, 23 people uh, didn't know. So that's why the sample size will vary. Okay? Now, for many of us that have been in security for a long time, we may recall, I don't know, six, seven years ago, Gartner did some research in this area, uh, and the average response uh, was 5%. Okay, in other words, out of every $100 we spend in IT on everything in the world of IT, 5% of those dollars uh, went to security. Well, let me tell you, those days are long gone. Uh, so we've asked this question for the past two years. In 2015, uh, the most uh, common response was 6 to 10%, but then there were responses up from there. And that's the dark blue bar. The burgundy, the reddish burgundy colored bar, the most common response in this year's report, 11 to 15 percent. Okay, so key takeaway here is the most common response, uh, you know, uh, has risen 11 to 15 percent, but nearly 60 percent are spending 11 percent or more in security, and the trend is rising. Okay, uh, now in terms of uh, uh, industry, on the right hand side of the screen, these are uh, industries that are that are spending six. 15% or more on security. Telecom and technology uh, leading the way. 38.9% of telecom and technology respondents are spending 16% or more on security, followed by healthcare, government, retail, and so on. Okay. And by the way, I mentioned that there were 26 questions that were asked. Uh, in this presentation, we're going to go roughly, we're going to go through roughly half the responses. But again, I encourage you to download the report uh, to access, you know, all of the uh, the responses. Okay. Next question we ask, and uh, what percentage of your employer's IT budget is allocated 
Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we asked, how many times do you estimate that your organization's global network has been compromised by a successful cyber attack within the past uh, 12 months? Okay? And the choices were, and you can see on the left-hand side, not once, between one and five times, between six and ten times, more than ten times. Okay? And in 2015, the 2016 report are about attacks that happened in 15, 76 percent, three out of four respondents were affected by a successful cyber attack in 2015. Okay, so let's let's break this down a little bit. Let's look at 2014. Focus your eyes in the not once area on the left hand side. Not once, the light blue, 38 percent. So the inverse of that would be 62. Uh, so 62% were affected in 2014. Uh, the inverse of 29.5 would be, what is that, 70.5 were affected. And now we're at 76.6, uh, uh, you know, or, or about 70, uh, uh, 76% were affected by a successful attack in 2015. Hey, hey yeah. Steve? Yep. Yeah, just an observation on this one. So uh, I, I'd ask... This is 76% uh, stated that you know they're um, they, they believe they were in fact compromised. But those that uh, not not reflected here is uh, you know an organization that uh, got compromised, but they didn't know about it, and they don't they don't they don't think it happened yet. So it's the it's those that are unaware. And I, I just put out to the audience to ask themselves. How confident are you that, that you or your organization would know if credentials or when credentials get compromised or when a host gets compromised? Assess your own level of confidence, and I suspect you know, many of the viewers would, would admit not a high degree of confidence, and, and therefore you know, I, I would speculate that the number of organizations that were surveyed that actually did achieve a, 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 a or experience a successful cyber attack is much higher than the seventy six percent. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that. There's, you know, the the sort of the joke. There's two types of uh, security professionals: those that know that they've been compromised, and those that don't know that they've been compromised. You know, where yeah. you know virtually everyone, you know, every every network out there has has been compromised, and so that that's a fair point. Uh, and one of the trends that we're going to see uh, in, in this year's report, and we're going to talk about this later, is uh, increased investments around security analytics and user analytics. Uh, organizations, you know, it, years ago it used to be, you know, security professionals were measured on their ability to prevent cyber attacks. You know, how, you know we haven't had any major attacks this year or, or whatever. I think moving forward, it's not going to be how well we can prevent these attacks, but how well we can identify and quickly respond to these attacks, re reduce the mean time to response, and be able to mitigate and remediate these threats before any significant damage is, is done. So certainly we're seeing a lot of investment in SIM and security analytics, and uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, just to your point, so yeah, that's great, Mike. Yeah, great. And, and uh, before our call, I encouraged Mike over and over, I said, please interrupt me. Uh, anytime because I love interactive webinars and that goes to all of you in the audience the more questions you guys ask in the audience the happier we're going to be so at any time feel free to submit a question uh, we may not be able to get to it to the end but uh, we would love uh, to, to receive lots of questions so feel free to pose those anytime on the right hand side of the screen uh, we have some breakdown by country so percentage compromised at least once by a successful cyber attack Brazil uh, you know, home of the Olympics, uh, uh, leading the charge at 89.1% of responding, um, um, you know, of respondents uh, can see that, that their organization has been uh, breached at least once, followed by France, Canada, Germany, and then the United States. Moving on. Next question. Uh, we asked, uh, what is the likelihood that your organization's network will become compromised by a successful attack in 2016? So in other words, how optimistic are you? You know, you, we know that you know three out of four of you have said that uh, your organization was breached last year. In the coming year, how confident are you that that uh, you're going to be able to defend your network? What's the likelihood? Okay, so let's focus our our eyes on the not likely and somewhat uh, unlikely. Uh, if, if we add together 
uh, you know, the not likely and somewhat unlikely, and then take the inverse, that comes out to about 62% expect to be victimized again in 2016. Well, hold on. We had 75, 76% said that they were affected. 62% are confident it won't happen again. There's a gap there, 13, 14 percentage points. Why are we suddenly more confident? Are we just, you know, optimistic people? Are security professionals uh, just, in, in general, a little, little bit more optimistic? Well, let's look at the trends here. In 2014, uh, you know, if you take not likely and somewhat unlikely, uh, you know, roughly 60. What was that? Uh, so 30, 33. Uh, so about 37 uh, percent, you know, said that that it was, you know, uh, that they were optimistic. But then that number fell, uh, and last year was the first time where we had a majority of respondents felt that it was uh, more likely. And this year, so so in other words, pessimism is growing. Expectations for our ability to prevent successful compromises is sinking. Expectations are sinking, um, you know, but. Uh, you know, we want to be optimistic. You know, I'm a glasses half full type person, uh, but as a security professional, I'm, you know, I'm I'm a little little gun shy. I don't know. What are your thoughts, Mike? Well, you know, it's, it's I'm glad you raised it. I think there's a distinction that that can and should be made here, and that is um, the, the difference between a compromise and a breach. And a lot of organizations think you know a compromise leads to a breach, but it doesn't have to. That's and to your point earlier, you know, with with the um, you know with the growing sophistication of these threat actors, increasing their ability to get into the networks, uh, it's inevitable they're going to get in. The question is, what are you going to do when it happens? And I think that's really where organizations, and we're seeing evidence in buying trends that that organizations are coming to invest more to uh, it, it, it increase their ability to detect when they get in so that they can respond fast enough to avoid a breach. And I think that's the real thing, you know, takeaway here is, um, you know, uh, take a hard look at your confidence that you won't get compromised uh, and, uh, and, and, and reevaluate that. If you were one of those folks that actually took the survey, um, and, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you're one of the 38% that believes you won't get compromised. Well, rethink that um, and, and face the reality that most organizations will get compromised. But the question is, what do you do when it happens? Um, and, and there's a lot that can be done. And I think the spending trends in, in a few slides will, will, will point that out. Absolutely. All right. And let's move on to the next question. On a scale of one to five, with five being highest, Rate your organization's overall security posture, in other words, ability to defend cyber threats, in each of the following areas. Okay, So those items, uh, so again, one to five, five being highest. Uh, the items, those bars, those burgundy, reddish colored bars, uh, we have data center, physical servers, and then virtual servers in the data center, followed by web servers and then your DMZ, followed by your cloud infrastructure, cloud apps. Now at the bottom, we have mobile devices, okay? So in other words, we're less confident about our security posture when it comes to mobile devices, uh, securing access to social media applications, uh, laptops and notebooks, and then followed by desktop PCs. To me, this is kind of intuitive, you know, those devices that aren't always, you know, static, uh, you know, physical servers, virtual servers may, you know, uh, migrate from one host to another, um, you know, but they're under IT's control, you know, and they're, they're in a place that's heavily fortified, uh, you know, by network security defenses, you know, at the perimeter and, and inside the core. But mobile devices, laptops, these things, these things are more difficult, and this is certainly acknowledged. Uh, later we'll talk about investments made in, uh, you know, in, in security products, and I think there's still a lot of room uh, uh, to go, you know, in, in securing these, these different devices. Uh, next question. So uh, uh, the topic here is network security deployment plans. We asked, which of the following network security technologies are currently in use or planned for acquisition, meaning within the next 12 months, by your organization to guard all network assets against cyber threats? Now, in this table, and again, uh, for those that join late, you, uh, within Bright Talk, there's a mechanism to uh, enlarge the slide, perhaps make it full screen. Uh, you know, I think it, in the lower part of your screen, you might be able to right-click or click on a button to do that. Uh, but the first column is currently in use, 
Okay, so the darker the shade, the higher the number. Okay, so network AV been around forever. Signature based uh, threat detection has been around. Uh, you know, that's uh, grown. Advanced malware analysis, sandboxing, it's interesting. Uh, you know, that that's certainly has sparked in recent years. That's, that's certainly taken off. Secure email gateway, secure web gateway. Now, the next column is plan for acquisition, okay? Uh, and the darker shades here are, are things that are heavily budgeted in the coming uh, 12 months, okay? And then no plans are organizations that really just don't have any you know, plans for, for this sorts of uh, uh, technology, okay? Key takeaway here, uh, next-gen firewall uh, is, is uh, you know, very hot. That leads to charge at 41.2%. Uh, threat intelligence at 38.1%. Uh, but then we also have, uh, you know, security analytics and, and uh, user behavior analytics. Uh, you know, security uh, user behavior analytics, 35.9. Security analytics right behind there at 35.5. Uh, you know, and, and so I think one of the things that we're seeing here is, is organizations are realizing that they can't just, you know, rely on perimeter security alone and traditional security, but they need additional uh, technology to detect threats from inside, from threats that are hand-carried on mobile devices, threats that may come in through other means, uh, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, instant messaging or other, other mechanisms. Um, you know, so, so Mike, we want to chime in here. Any any Thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I, I think you've you've started uh, down the, a, a healthy path here to evaluate the data. I think what the 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 strength and popularity of analytics, whether it's broad security analytics with you know network analytics or endpoint analytics or or even user behavior analytics, I, I think it's indicative of. Uh, IT professionals coming to realize that they need automated help. They need they need help in machine analytics to detect the the indicators that uh, you've got a threat actor at play in their network. Um, and uh, you know, for for many IT security professionals, they've you know historically been uh, limited to tools that enable them to go hunt, but oftentimes they don't know what to hunt for. And there's so much data to do this manually. Uh, it almost uh, guarantees that if you do discover something, uh, it's probably going to be too late. Uh, and so I, I think the, the spending patterns on this particular question indicate a, 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 uh, a rapid growing uh, popularity and appreciation for uh, machine analytics. Absolutely agree. Yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of uh, one of the themes that we're going to be seeing in the years ahead, uh, you know, uh, about these next generation security solutions that are not relying on your old legacy traditional uh, signature based defenses. Yeah, so good, good, good observation. Uh, moving on, next uh, question around monitoring privileged users. So these are administrators, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, IT personnel that have privileged uh, user access. Describe your agreement with the following statement. My organization has invested adequately in technology to monitor activities of users with elevated or privileged access rights. Okay. Uh, key takeaway here, oh, and this is, this is a little scary for me, only 30% are confident in their organization's ability to monitor privileged users. Okay. And you know, most of us are familiar with the attack kill chain, advanced persistent threats, advanced targeted attacks. Um, you know, one of the steps in the kill chain is after you've uh, compromised an endpoint through maybe some Windows vulnerability, and you have your remote access trojan, and and you've now you know taken control of that. You've you know moved laterally across the network. At some point along the way, uh, you may be. Uh, you, you know, you may, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the threat actor may compromise some administrator privileges. So monitoring privileged users isn't just about insider threats. It's not just not trusting your people. It's also making sure that you can detect potential compromises of administrative credentials uh, that can, you know, uh, lead to, uh, you know, data exfiltration and, and other bad things related to uh, an advanced targeted attack. So that's the yeah. first of the – yeah. Oh, go ahead, Mike. No, I was just going to – I think your point is, is spot on on this one. Um, and if you look at some of the other research that's out there with the Verizon Data Breach Report, they, uh, I, they haven't carried this, this specific stat in a couple of years, but um, I want to say it was three years ago, 
uh, the, uh, their, their research showed that, I believe it was 83% of reported breaches involved the use of weaker stolen credentials. So this is, this is almost invariably a key step in, uh, in the successful uh, execution of a, of a cyber attack. So uh, I, I would venture to, to, to posit that you know, uh, most breaches will in fact involve uh, compromised credentials and the vast majority of misuse of privileged user credentials are not by those to whom they were originally issued. Yep, I completely so. agree. And, th and thus, we're seeing uh, you know, increased investment in uh, security analytics, user in analytics, and certainly privileged uh, uh, access monitoring uh, you know, is, is uh, an important area to uh, invest, so, so good points. Um, okay, so that was the first of the four sections around the security posture. Second of the four sections here is around perceptions and concerns. So let's uh, uh, look, at, look at our uh, first question in this section. We asked, on a scale of one to five, with five being highest, rate your overall concern for each of the following types of cyber threats targeting your organization. Okay? For three uh, consecutive years, malware is the number one concern. And also for three consecutive years, phishing and spear phishing uh, you know, has been a concern. The last couple of years, we've asked about SSL encrypted threats. SSL is a, is a blind spot in many organizations. And you know, if, if uh, a network security device is not equipped uh, to uh, decrypt SSL traffic or inspect SSL traffic, then you know, that's a big blind spot. And that can be maybe a third of your traffic at the perimeter. So that's certainly a concern. Um, you know, we have seen, and if you look at the delta here, the biggest, you know, big jump, denial of service attacks and distributed denial of service attacks, big, big jump, especially, uh, I would say, in recent years because of uh, uh, hacktivism and anonymous, uh, you know, uh, taking down uh, sites through DDoS attacks. Uh, then, of course, you know, your advanced targeted attacks, web application attacks, your, your oldies but baddies, your buffer overflows, your SQL injections, your cross-site scripting. Uh, zero days are, are a concern. Uh, on the grand scheme of thing, I, I don't know if, uh, uh, if it's as big of an issue. Certainly, uh, you know, you can be uh, affected by a zero day, but out of the thousands and thousands of vulnerabilities that are registered uh, in the um, uh, National Vulnerability Database and, and you know, registered with CVEs, I think maybe a couple of dozen of them uh, each year uh, originated as zero days. But still, it's, it's definitely a concern. Watering hole attacks is, is something reasonably new in recent years where a website may be affected and then uh, people visit that website, uh, you know, kind of like uh, water buffaloes visiting a watering hole, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and then drive-bys, you know, where you just connect to a website and you're infected. Now, what's interesting here uh, is the across-the-board increase in overall concern. Look at the burgundy lines for, for our, our current year's report, 2016, and then look at the dark blues and the light blues, which are a big step behind. So in other words, there's a pretty elevated awareness of cyber threats uh, across the board uh, that, that we're seeing. Yeah. Uh, any observations, Mike? Uh, I would. I, I think uh, if you listed uh, e even a handful more uh, threat vectors, you'd likely see a similar pattern. Not a single category had a drop in uh, level of concern. So yep. I, I think it's indicative of the fact that these, you know, there's so much uh, money being made in, in by the cyber criminals today, um, and even these uh, sort of you know other entities that you know other than cyber criminals, maybe it's cyber terrorists. Uh, or uh, you know, rogue nations, they're they're funding innovation well ahead of technologies being developed to keep the bad guys out. Uh, and I, I think this level of concern reflected in this chart shows uh, a recognition of that. Yeah, very good. All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, uh, we asked. Um, uh, let's see, how has the volume of mobile device threats targeting your users' smartphones and tablets changed in the past 12 months? So this is about uh, mobile device threats. Okay? Uh, nearly two-thirds of respondents perceived a rise in mobile device threats. So I think uh, no surprise there. And that goes back to the previous slide uh, you know, about uh, the overall concern about 
mobile device or, or, or your security posture, your ability to mitigate risks affecting mobile device. That was the weakest link in the chain. Uh, and then by industry, uh, finance has seen the largest increase uh, in mobile device threats, followed by telecom and technology uh, and retail. Uh, next question, select the following reasons your organization has integrated commercial and or open source threat intelligence into your existing security infrastructure. This is one, select all that applies. So why might you license um, you know, third-party threat intelligence integrated into your SIM, integrated into your network security devices? Certainly vendors invest a lot of money uh, you know, in, in threat intelligence, so this isn't always uh, necessary in some instances to supplement. Uh, but number one reason across the board for two years in a row, improve your ability to block threats. Okay, uh, so more of a prevention play, uh, followed by improve uh, your ability to detect threats. Okay, uh, and then investigating threats, uh, reducing unwanted, uh, unauthorized traffic, and improve enforcement. Um, so, Mike, I know Logarithm, uh, you know, has, has you know made significant investments uh, in this area. Any any thoughts? Well, to your point about our investments, we, we've chosen to, to remain uh, Switzerland here um, and support a myriad of, uh, of threat feed uh, types, whether they're commercial or open source. So effectively, we've empowered customers to select the threat feeds they feel are most uh, insightful and valuable for their business, and then they can automatically uh, uh, be fed into Logarithm's uh, AI engine uh, for consideration by our, uh, our, our analytics. The, the interesting thing I see here, though, is the trend from 15 to 16, where there seems to be a drop, uh, perhaps reflective of confidence in, in the respondents' uh, uh, sort of optimism in their ability to make use of threat intel data. Uh, you know, it's a, we, we've heard over the last 18 months that uh, you know, the, the more information you take in, the less valuable it is absent uh, a, an automated way to cull this data and analyze it. Uh, I think there was, you know, a lot, a lot of folks for a while were thinking, let's bring in all this threat intel data and we'll search through it. We'll find, you know, uh, you know really valuable, actionable, you know, uh, uh, items. And they're just overwhelmed with the data. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to see these trends and, in, uh, in percent of folks applying threat intel to achieve goals they originally set out for. What's, what's also going to be interesting in the years ahead is as uh, we find more endpoint security solutions, more network security solutions, perhaps even cloud solutions that leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence and have mechanisms for detecting threats without signatures and without threat intelligence of IP blacklists and, and URL blacklists and things of that nature, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this affects the uh, threat intelligence industry, which right now is pretty red hot. Um, so that, that's going well, to be interesting to see that. It, yeah, it is. I think you, you raise a good point, and it, uh, it, um, it reminds me of sort of the, the what, what we do when we recognize an inbound attack in the logarithm platform, uh, when we see an attack, we, uh, we map that IP address into a list of now known bad IPs. So it's the origin IP address of the attacker um, or you know, the destination IP of what appears to be command and control activity. So I, you know, Logarithm Security Intelligence Platform uh, is, is able to build uh, you know, a, a threat intel um, uh, list and a threat intel feed internally just based upon what we're seeing and through our own analytics. So you're spot on. I think the application of machine analytics and machine learning uh, will, will redefine what true um, you know, threat intel really means. Yep, yep, excellent. So uh, we're about 25 minutes to the top of the hour, um, uh, and we're approaching the halfway mark, so we're doing pretty good on time. But I'm going to try to move through uh, some of these additional slides because we definitely want to save time for Q&A at the end. And just a friendly reminder, submit your questions anytime into the uh, uh, question interface of Bright Talk. Uh, the more questions you guys ask, the happier we're going to be. 
Uh, SIM deployment use cases. Speaking of SIM, we were just talking about that. Select the reasons your organization operates security information and event management technology. Select all that apply. Uh, this is the first year that we've asked this question, but uh, certainly something that we would like to ask in, in future years. Uh, so we had four choices uh, to improve threat detection, to automate incident response, to aggregate security alerts, to maintain regulatory compliance. So what's interesting here is we have significant responses in all of these areas. These are all very important use cases. But number one, top on the list, to improve threat detection. Any surprises there, Mike? Uh, I wouldn't say there are surprises. I, uh, although I, um, just a, an observation on on the uh, difference between you know from 70 just over 70 percent to 42 percent, uh, that being you know threat detection versus incident response. Incident response is critical. When you detect something, you've got to respond quickly. But the the uh, growing uh, you know, expectation for value in the area of threat detection from your SEM platform, I think, is, is quite telling. I think there's a growing uh, acknowledgement in, uh, of the importance of machine analytics and real-time analytics uh, in, in order to, uh, to fuel uh, early detection of these threat indicators. And, uh, and I think the 70% is, is a, a strong indicator of that. Very good. Uh, let's see, moving on. Uh, so this is one of my favorite questions. And again, this is going to be hard to read. So if you haven't yet popped your uh, presentation in a full screen mode or enlarge the slides, there's a way to do that in Bright Talk. Uh, this would be an excellent opportunity to do that. But I'll read the question for you and, and you know, uh, so you understand what we're asking here. This is another one to five question with five being highest. Rate how each of the following inhibit your organization from adequately defending itself against cyber threats. So a way, another way to paraphrase this question is, what's standing in your way? As a security professional, what is standing in the way of doing your job, of mitigating threats, preventing these threats from happening, resolving, you know, just improving your security posture and, and reducing risk? What, what's standing in the way? So some of the choices, lack of budget, lack of management support, um, you know, maybe there's lack of effective solutions on the market, too many false positives. What's standing in the way? Number one response, three years in a row, low security awareness among employees. Okay? It's not a technology problem. Well, it, it is to an extent a technology problem, but the biggest, uh, the, 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 the biggest problem of what's standing in the way are your colleagues, are the people. Okay? Your, your workforce is your human firewall. And there are too many organizations, Mike, where they, they, you know, there's an onboarding process, they bring them on board, and then someone from the IT department comes in and spends 15 minutes or 30 minutes or maybe an hour talking about security. Uh, they'll give you a, a post-it note you know, pack or something to put on your desk. Security is everyone's responsibility. Maybe once in a while they'll send out an email or whatever. But, but organizations are not, in my view, investing enough in the ongoing training uh, around security awareness. I mean, uh, you know, and the first year we asked this question, I was a little surprised. I thought budget was going to be number one, but it was actually security awareness. Any any surprises there, Mike? Any thoughts? No, uh, you know, I, I it makes sense. It makes good sense as these uh, as the threat actors get more sophisticated. Uh, there are new uh, approaches they're taking to getting into the organization. You know. We, our Logarithm Labs team worked with our content marketing group here to develop an infographic, uh, which is a sort of top 10 ways to recognize a spear phishing attack. And, and it was written in a way with graphics and, and, and simplistic messaging uh, so that it would appeal uh, not to information security professionals per se, but to the employees uh, of, of their companies. So, um, I'll just throw out. I, I, we didn't. I didn't plan to cover it in, in today's call, but if, if any of the attendees uh, to today's webinar are interested in getting our infographic on, you know, ten ways to detect uh, spear phishing, uh, it, you know, to use with your own employee education and security awareness, we'd, we'd love to get it to you. So just uh, you can go ahead and hit our website and uh, request more info, or just engage with us at the website, and we'll get that over to you. 
Fantastic. Section number three of four, and we have five more slides uh, with uh, survey questions and responses, and then I'll uh, cover some key takeaways and then let, let uh, Mike wrap things up for us. Uh, so I think we are probably going to go pretty close to the top of the hour here. Third of the four sections of our report, attack surface reduction. And we have a, a couple of questions that I wanted to highlight here that we asked a couple of survey responses. Uh, we asked, which of the following technologies does your organization regularly use to reduce your network's attack surface? Choices were NAC, you know, network access control, pen testing, uh, security configuration management, file integrity monitoring, vulnerability assessment, vulnerability management. Uh, and uh, uh, two years in a row, NAC. Uh, NAC is, uh, uh, you know, I would say an underrated uh, technology, but very useful. Uh, we're going to talk about BYOD and some really interesting things that the, this report uncovered uh, in just a few slides. But if you are entertaining BYOD in your organization, or if you have BYOD, bring your own device policies, letting your users, you know, use their own smartphones and tablets. If you don't have NAC, uh, I would encourage you to uh, uh, look at that technology. It's it's really important stuff. The other the other stuff is your your uh, you know your standard you know technology has been around for for quite a while, uh, but what's interesting is is and this is backed by the Verizon report. I don't have this stat in front of me, but more than 90% of the data breaches uh, you know that Verizon covers in any given year are related to um, uh, cyber attacks that exploit known vulnerabilities that haven't been patched yet. And so I think organizations really are underinvesting in the basic blocking and tackling technologies that have been around for years, but we as security professionals just aren't doing a good enough job in reducing using existing technology that's been around forever to reduce our network's attack surface. Uh, Mike, any thoughts? No, I, I, I think you've, you've covered it. I'm yeah. going to let you uh, plow towards the end here. Good. Uh, frequency of vulnerability scans, uh, this is something kind of scary to me. And uh, how frequently does your organization conduct full network active vulnerability scans? Uh, and, and, you know, the, the trend is we're, we're doing it more. So if you look at the burgundy color bars toward the top, uh, more people are doing it daily, more people are doing it weekly, more monthly, more quarterly. That's good. Less people semi-annually. And so we're getting better at scanning the network. I don't know if we're getting better at patching uh, you know, vulnerabilities, especially in uh, endpoint devices. Uh, fourth and final area, uh, future plans. Uh, and uh, the question that we asked here, do you expect your employer's overall IT security budget to increase or decrease in 2016? Okay. So on the left-hand side, we have three little donuts here. We have a donut for 2014, 15, and 16. And the burgundy shading and the, the number, you know, in the burgundy section of each of these, percentages indicating that their IT budgets are growing. Okay? So in 2014, less than half are growing. 2015, 6 out of 10. 2016, uh, 3 out of 4. Okay? So this echoes back, you know, we're, we're, we're investing a larger portion of our IT budget on security, and, uh, you know, that equates to uh, an overall budget increase year after year. I don't know how sustainable this is going to be. Uh, you know, certainly as security professionals, it's kind of good news for us. We've got jobs. Uh, there's, you know, there's certainly, a, you know, there's not enough security professionals to go around. So we're in a fantastic profession. But, you know, as, as humans, <laughs> you know, that, that don't want our organizations to be breached, uh, you know, this is, this is challenging, you know, and I don't know how sustainable this is going to be. From an uh, industry's perspective, percentage of growing IT security budgets by, increase, uh, by industry, Telecom uh, leading the way, followed by manufacturing, finance, uh, and healthcare. A uh, couple more slides here, and then we'll we'll do some key takeaways. Uh, BYOD. This uh, is is a really one of the more interesting findings of the Cyber Threat Defense Report. So, for everyone's benefit, BYOD: bring your own device. This is a policy allow your employees to use their own smartphones, tablets, maybe even their own laptops to access company applications and data. So the question is. When, if ever, do you expect your organization to implement a BYOD policy uh, to allow employee-owned devices to access confidential data and apps? Okay? So let's start at the bottom of this chart where it says already implemented. And let's look at the lighter blue shade at the very, very, very bottom. 31% okay? said, already got it. We're there. We've got BYOD policies in place. 
Now let's look at the next section, one section up. It says, within the next year, 26.1. Okay. In other words, 26% said, you know, we don't have BYOD right now, but next year, by this time next year, we're going to have it. Okay, great. So if we had 31%, you know, to start with, 26% promised they were going to have BYOD within a year, add those two numbers together. If everyone kept their promise, maybe we'd be at, a, at 56, 57%. Did we go up? Wrong. We went down a hair to 30.5 in 2015. Okay, we said, all right, in the next year, how many percent, what percentage of you are going to roll out BYOD in the next year? 2015, 28.7%. Okay, add 30, 30.5, 28.7, we're going to come out with about, uh, what, 59 and change. So 59%, by the, but one year later, we should have that. Did it go up? No, it went down. Okay, so in other words, IT organizations are making promises that they're not keeping. They're, you know, they're, they're intending to roll out BYOD within the next year, maybe the next two years, okay? but they're not keeping their promises, and the number of actual BYOD implementations is falling very gradually. But what's interesting is it's not rising. Uh, IT organizations are not keeping their promises. Why? Well, if you're the CISO uh, and you're watching the evening news and you're seeing all these major network breaches, offering BYOD dramatically increases risk you know, of these devices that IT doesn't maintain. Certainly, NAC technology is one way to help you know, uh, minimize some of those risks. Uh, mobile device management technology is things that you can invest in, but on the grand scheme of things, it increases your, your attack surface dramatically. And is this the cyber threat climate that we want to do that? So I think that, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and then uh, last question uh, that we asked, uh, well, for today's presentation, and then you know, Mike's going to tell you how you can get a uh, copy of the report, um, but uh, this is on the topic of endpoint security. This is also very, very telling. For three years, we asked, which of the following best describes your organization's intent to evaluate new or alternative anti-malware protection for endpoints, endpoints being desktops and laptops? Okay. Uh, 2014, 44.5 said we're fine. Okay, no, we, we don't have any plans. We're, we're content with our endpoint security. 44.5. So the inverse of 44.5 is what? 55.5 said. Yeah, we're evaluating. Okay. Next year, big change. 32% said we're fine. So the inverse of that is what? 67.3. Uh, so 67% said. You know what? We're two out of three said we're not happy. We're evaluating. We're evaluating to replace our current security, endpoint security, or maybe we're going to augment. Maybe it'll be in a, a secondary layer on the endpoint. Now, 2016, boom, huge, huge change. Okay, 86.1% of the respondents are fed up with their current endpoint security. Okay, many of them are using traditional antivirus, traditional signature-based protections, relying heavily on that, which, of course, you know, today's cyber threats pass, you know, sail through that stuff like it's standing still. Okay, 86% are evaluating new endpoint security solutions. Roughly half of that 86% is looking to replace, and, and roughly half is looking to augment. Big, big paradigm shift, tons of investment made in endpoint security solutions. Uh, you know, we now have endpoint protection, uh, you know, uh, N EPP, Gartner calls it endpoint protection platforms, endpoint detection and response, EDR, lots of investments. Uh, and this bodes well for, for those types of uh, players. Yeah, good. All right, so let's wrap up here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Mike, uh, uh, to, again, and tell you how to, to access the report. Uh, and now is a great time. Please, folks, uh, uh, there are a ton of you, and I'm so thrilled with the turnout. Uh, uh, you guys have exceeded my expectations in, in terms of the uh, volume of uh, folks interested in this presentation. I'm so grateful for your time. Uh, but key takeaways here. One is cyber attacks are rising, successful attacks. This in, uh, uh, a couple of years ago in the 2014 report, it was six in 10 respondents, um, you know, uh, witnessed a successful cyber attack. This year, three out of four. Optimism is dwindling, okay? In that same time period, it went from 38% uh, felt that, that a successful attack was likely. Now it's like six out of 10, you know? 
Um, so optimism is, 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 is certainly falling. Malware and spear phishing, always top of mind. Okay, and 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 uh, that's a very big concern. Uh, the bad guys, you know, your cyber threat actors, cyber criminals, uh, uh, hacktivists, uh, nation-state threat actors. They're very sophisticated. They're very well funded, and targeted threats are, uh, you know, definitely a big, much bigger concern than they were, you know, many years ago. Uh, a couple more takeaways. SIM plays a pivotal role. Must have technology for. Uh, you know, enterprise security. Good news, 87% uh, either have SIM or are planning to acquire SIM. The inverse of that, 13%, uh, I'm going to speak for myself, okay, this is just my opinion. Uh, you don't, if you're, you know, you're uh, an enterprise, you haven't invested in SIM, you're asking for it. You're just basically asking uh, to, to be compromised. It's, it, it's, Silly not to have it, especially when there's so many good options out there. 70% uh, leverage SIM as uh, a key component in their threat detection uh, capabilities. Okay, not just for you know the, the security analysts and the SOC looking at security events, but an additional layer of a sensible defense and depth strategy. Security analytics. Uh, I was at the RSA conference, as I'm sure many of you were. That was a big theme in this year's uh, uh, you know. Uh, RSA, uh, so many vendors, so much in investment, so much talk about uh, security analytics and user analytics. 88% uh, have or plan to acquire security analytics or full packet capture uh, and analysis technology in 2016. I think that's one of the biggest themes of, of this year's conference. Um, so these are some of the key takeaways. Um, you know, I'm going to stick around. Uh, I hope you guys ask lots of questions and submit them. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mike to tell you how to access the report and, and uh, hopefully respond to some of your questions. Great. That sounds great. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, so in terms of access to the report, uh, fortunately, right now you have access to it. I see uh, it looks like uh, 43 people have downloaded it during this webinar alone. So. Um, you can download it as uh, one of the attachments available to you through the BrightTalk interface that we're using today for this webinar. Uh, uh, or you can go to the URL that's uh, on this slide that you're seeing right now and download the report. Uh, as I mentioned before, we also have uh, – we're, 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 uh, we're developing a number of infographics that – are designed to be helpful uh, to you as information security professionals in educating the broader employee base. Our, our first one we came out with was recognizing a phishing attack. Uh, we've got uh, another uh, infographic we just produced, which is uh, um, uh, how to uh, um, uh, recognize uh, ransomware um, and, and uh, key steps to take when, uh, when you discover you've got ransomware. Uh, at, at play in your environment, and we're developing more and more infographics over time. So if you'd like one of those infographics, go ahead and engage with us via our website. Um, and uh, there's a chat button that's uh, live on our website, and we're happy to get that over to you as well. Uh, additionally, if uh, we found that a number of uh, folks considering security intelligence or a new uh, a new SEM platform. Uh, they, they find it quite valuable to see a, a live uh, interactive demo uh, with one of our uh, logarithm uh, experts. So if you'd like to schedule a live you know, a demo where we take you online and, and show you exactly how Logarithm's platform is helping uh, organizations detect ransomware, detect uh, you know, spear phishing, uh, respond to advanced cyber attacks, we'd love to, uh, to, uh, to perform that online demo for you. So feel free to uh, go to our website. Um, you can go to the URL posted here, or just go to our website and uh, click schedule a, demo, uh, schedule a live demo, and we'll get that set up for you. Um, let's see. So let's go to some questions here. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to pull up these questions. All right, did something happen to the sound on your end? Uh, well, it looks like hopefully you're all able to hear us. It looks like given the number of folks that are still sticking with us, we've got uh, um, a number still here. Uh, pull up the other questions here. 
I can respond to the one on CPE, CPE uh, yep. credit if you'd like. So the question is, um, uh, will the attendees be able to receive a certificate of attendance for this webinar and his CPE you know, uh, credit? Uh, I'm a CISSP uh, with the ISC squared. I'm a certified information systems security professional. Uh, and uh, all you need, I mean, you know, you don't really need a certificate of attendance. What I would do is if you just want to have evidence, uh, you know, audit, uh, just print out your uh, confirmation, your registration confirmation uh, that you had and then just take that in the file. And it's really an honor system anyway. I've never met anyone that's been audited. Uh, you know, and, and certainly there's, you know, it, it, uh, CISSP is just one of a dozen certifications. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, so yep. I would just print out the confirmation and you should be set there. You know. So what else we got, okay. Mike? Well, I got, let's see, this one is for log rhythm. In regards to what cyber threats people are concerned about, does the report outline a good list or other other types of attacks that people should be worried about but aren't. Uh, that's that's a great question. I think I, I think we both probably have a perspective on that one, Steve. Why don't you talk about the report and then I'll I'll share my my thoughts there. Yeah. So we we um, provided a um, a broad list, but you actually said something, Mike, that uh, uh, something that we're kicking around for next year. Uh, I would say uh, w one of the biggest trends in the past year or two. Uh, you know, one of the biggest uh, types of cyber attacks that has been on the rise, I would say, is DDoS, distributed denial of service attacks. But uh -huh. in the past 12 months, you actually used the R word, Mike, ransomware. Yeah. Uh, and, yep. and in our survey, that could fall under mal malware. But I think uh, I'm going to seriously consider adding it as a separate item uh, for next year's study. Uh, and remind me, Mike, when we do this again next year, hopefully uh, yeah. you know, Logarithm can participate again. Uh, you know, but I, I would like to see that added. And that there's just been so much uh, dramatic increase uh, in in ransomware attacks. Uh, that, that that those are my thoughts. Yep. No, I I would agree with you. I think we're hearing from customers uh, a growing concern, and it's not just at the CISO level. It's at the board level uh, as more high-profile organizations, uh, you know, are responding to ransomware and it's getting out into the media. More boards are asking their CEOs, uh, what are we doing, you know, to uh, prepare ourselves for a, a ransomware attack? And it, it, I think it ties back to being able to recognize the indicators of ransomware. You know, there are, uh, there are communications that occur um, between the affected, the infected system uh, and, uh, and the uh, ultimate command uh, and control site uh, when ransomware is enabled. There's, uh, uh, there are changes to files on those systems. There's network traffic that is indicative of the commencement of a ransomware attack. And so while it's, it's unlikely you're going to prevent it from getting in, there are many ways to uh, mitigate the impact on the organization, such as the spreading of it to uh, you know, file shares or other systems. Um, but you have to have the right technology in place to detect those early warning signs and be able to automate the response. So, good. Um, yeah, I think that's a big one. Looks so like we have about more three questions. more minutes to the top of the hour. Is there another question you wanted to ask, uh, Mike, or uh, bring from the audience? Sure, let's see here. Uh, the report shows that SIM analytics and threat intelligence ranked amongst the highest for planned technology acquisitions in 16. Why are these technologies more in demand than traditional defenses? Well, I, you know, it's, I think you answered that one, Steve, during the, the presentation. It's like, the, you know, the traditional signature-based defenses uh, and the presumption that we can keep them out, I, I think, is falling by the wayside. That You know, people are realizing that uh, we need to accept the fact that the bad guys will get in. The question is how prepared are we to detect when they do and respond fast enough to keep them from either getting away with the goods or executing on their goal. And, um, and, and, and these technologies, SEM, analytics, and threat intelligence, when combined, uh, offer, I think, the best, uh, the best response to that. Totally agree. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Well, well, thank you all for participating today. It's been uh, appreciate your questions, uh, Steve. This is great information. Please keep these, uh, you know, these surveys coming. It's uh, it's it's insightful and, and helpful to many. So.
Yeah, and, um, and also just that? to chime in just really quickly, thank you so much to Logarithm for being a, a gold sponsor of our uh, third annual Cyber Threat Defense Report. And thanks to all of you uh, for taking time out of your busy day to talk about this report. Uh, and please download the report, share it with your colleagues. It's a great way to see how your peers uh, you know, in, in your various country uh, and your industry, uh, you know, what investments are they making. So thanks to all of you and, and, and to you, Mike. I appreciate uh, you co-presenting with me today. This was great. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Steve, and, and thanks again to all the uh, folks that have attended. Have a great day.